switched on the machine. Thank you so much for coming. I'm a little bit sad because this is the last study for the year. Thank you all for being here tonight and for all those who will listen to the DVDs and the CDs and MP3s that will be made of these recordings. Already this week I had a dear lady in Mildura, brought a complete set, and uh, I went up to Broken Hill, and that was very interesting as well. And what a lot of rain, and locust by their millions. My whole radiator was nearly blocked off, I had to clean it. So you can see the book of Revelation is already <laughs> happening now. And the rain was torrential. It was just by the bucket full. I had to really slow down. I had a flat tyre. Bang! So it was not an uneventful trip. But praise the Lord, I'm here tonight with you. And it's good to see you. Shall we go to the next slide where we say, thank you for being here. Let us pray. Gracious God, our eternal Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the time that we can spend together looking at your most precious and important word, the word of God from Genesis to the book of Revelation. And we pray especially that as we look at scriptures tonight from Revelation, as well as many other scriptures as well, we pray that you will speak to us and draw us closer to thyself and help us to realize that we are living in momentous days. Father, we do pray for the people in this world who are unsaved, we pray that many more may come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. Bless us and draw us closer to thyself and to each other in Christian love. We ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, last Bible study, we looked at chapter 15. As you noticed, that was the shortest chapter in the book of Revelation, so we only took about 40 minutes. But tonight we take a little bit longer. So, Revelation, three important things. It concludes the events revealed in chapters 10 through to 15 concerning the visions in heaven and conditions on the earth to the middle of the tribulation period. That's what we looked at last week. It also serves as an introduction to the great tribulation, the last three and a half years of the tribulation period, described in chapter 16, when the seven angels pour out the bowls of the wrath of God. In other words, it reveals important truth concerning the wrath of God. When God becomes very angry with the peoples living during the seven years, especially during the second half of the three and a half years of the seven year period. All right? It's a total of seven years, but the last three and a half years are going to be the most awesome and destructive in every way. So this evening we will look at Revelation chapter 16 which deals with the judgments of the seven bowls which include amongst other things, now look at this, <coughs> grievous sores, sea of blood, rivers of blood, scorching heat, darkness and pain, the three frogs and a giant earthquake. So they're not little things. We've seen some of these things in the past including in Egypt, and we'll come back to that. And also in recent days, there have been natural calamities mm -hmm. which have been unheard of. But they don't compare with anything which is going to happen during the last three and a half years before the millennium starts and the Lord intervenes. The things mentioned and many more will take place through the last three and a half years before the return of Christ to this world to set up his 1,000 year reign known as the Millennial Kingdom. Before we read verse 1, let me say, just as an introduction, the seven angels, each holding a bowl containing the judgments that are about to fall on the earth, they seem reluctant to cast their bitter judgments forth, but they obey God because there is no alternative. He has to do this. However, they are obedient to the voice of God when he speaks saying, go your ways and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God upon the earth. These bowls constitute what the Lord Jesus referred to as the, the great tribulation. Remember the seven year period is divided in the two, three and a half year periods. It's the second half that is really the great tribulation. Matthew 24, 21 where our Lord speaks about that tribulation period. Wild and fanciful ideas have been offered through the years as a means of symbolizing or spiritualizing these judgments. 
Unfortunately, we cannot afford to do that because that is not what it's all about. These are real events that are going to take place in every detail and more awesome and more dreadful than we can possibly imagine, if you know what I mean. We cannot fully understand or comprehend. There is no scriptural basis for such symbolism, in other words. In fact, four of these seven judgments quite literally, remember, in the history of the Bible, took place in Egypt among the ten plagues and have been accepted by credible Bible teachers as literal. In addition, part of the sixth judgment, that of drying up the Euphrates River and producing frogs, was, were also literally fulfilled during the history of Israel. Remember? So we are not seeing anything new except the proportion and the magnitude of it is going to be even much greater, of great, greater magnitude. Frogs were generated as one of the plagues of Egypt and both the Red Sea and the Jordan River were rolled back that God's people might walk forth on dry ground. Therefore, nothing new will be transpiring when God dries up the Euphrates River that the kings of the east may march over on dry ground. If the plagues of Egypt were literal, and they certainly were, why should we not expect these awful judgments likewise to be literal? We shall now examine the judgments individually. The first bold judgments soars upon men. In Revelation 16, 1 and 2, and I heard a great voice out of the temple, this is the temple of God, saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark, now listen to this, upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which yeah. worshipped his image. So that excludes those who do not. We'll come back to that. This first bold judgment introduces grievous or painful source upon men. Clarence Larkin, in his excellent book, The Greatest Book on Dispensational Truth, said, In the word of God, when the first bowl is poured out on noisome and grievous sore, will fall upon the men who have the mark of the beast and who worship his image. This is a repetition of the sixth Egyptian plague that you'll find in Exodus 9, 8 to 12. If that was literal, why should not this be? We believe, as I said, and I make it abundantly clear, these plagues will all be literal. Do you also notice that only those who have the mark of the beast and worship his image will be selected for those awful sores? This would indicate that God in his marvellous grace will not bring judgment on believers during this latter half of the tribulation, but will protect them as he did the children of Israel during the plagues of Egypt. The second bold judgment, the seas turn to blood. Revelation 16, 3. And the second angel poured out his bowl upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. In this short verse, we encounter a catastrophic cat catastrophe for the earth that is almost beyond human comprehension. We have already seen that God will cause a third part of the sea to turn to blood during the second trumpet, but this second bowl includes the entire sea. The American Standard Version renders it, it became blood as of a dead man. That is, the entire sea will become corrupt so that every living thing in the sea will die. This does not take much imagination to see that when all living creatures in the seas die, they will float to the top, their decaying bodies discharging an unbearable stench and potentially dreadful diseases. It's really shocking when you think about it, what this judgment is going to do. This judgment could well interfere with commercial shipping and send whole populations into confusion as man gropes for an adequate supply of water. Because as we know, water is so necessary. Sometimes we've been praying for water when we haven't had any, and when we get a little bit too much, we pray for it to stop. And the farmers in some areas that, who haven't had a lot of rain in recent days now have too much. And that's part of what nature can do. 
Heaven gives justification for this terrible judgment. The earth dwellers have shed the blood of God's people, remember? So it is only right that they should drink blood. And this does not come without warning. God has warned the people at that time of what would happen if they did not repent and turn to God. In God's government, the punishment fits the crime. Pharaoh tried to drown the Jewish babies, but it was his own army that eventually drowned, drowned in the Red Sea. Haman planned to hang Mordecai on the gallows and to exterminate the Jews, remember? He, he devised a trick. It was a real trickery. But eventually he himself died. But he himself was hanged on the gallows and, and his family was exterminated. Esther 7, 10, 9 and 10. King Saul refused to obey God and slay the Amalekites. So he was slain by the Amalekites, 2 Samuel 1, 1 to 16. We come now to the third bowl judgment. Rivers and fountains <coughs> turn to blood. Revelation 16, 4 and 5 and 6. And the third angel poured out his bowl upon the rivers and fountains of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. In other words, they are receiving the punishment which was worthy of them because of all the evil that they had done. Revelation 16, 7. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. In other words, it was heard and it is proclaimed and it is made known that what the action that God took is right. This third bowl, a sequel to the second, <coughs> carries with it an interesting explanation as to why God permitted it. Now God will destroy the only remaining sources of water, the rivers and the fountains or springs of the deep, by letting them turn to blood. Whether this means literal blood is really inconsequential, for if Christ can turn water to wine, he certainly would turn water to blood. What is significant is that it will become corrupt blood which would breed disease and pestilence. One of the basic needs of mankind is water. Unless God provides water from another source or engineers by some process can turn this corruption into pure water, the world will be in a state of riot and confusion seeking this necessity of life, as you will well understand. The fourth bold judgment. This is another terrible thing when you think about it. Scorching heat of the sun. Coming from a cold country, from a cold climate country, even now when it gets above 40 degrees, I get very hot. I know that I was at Masada in the middle of summer and it was getting close to 50 degrees. It was certainly 45 and I tell you, I had to drink a lot of water <coughs> to get cool. But here we have something that is much worse. In Revelation 16, 8 and 9, and the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun and the power was given unto him to scourge men with fire. And men were scourged with great heat and blasphemed the name of God which had power over these plagues and they repented not to give him glory. See again, they repented not. They just kept on going. The, con the consistency of the sun is that it rises every morning and sets every evening, producing light and heat for man according to the seasons of the year, affords a great sense of security to all people. We know that the sun is very beneficial. We all need the sunlight. It's a rich vitamin. It, it produces energy, it produces light, it produces so many things. So it's very consistent. But when the Lord interferes with it, and he does something to it, it can cause all sorts of problems. So during the tribulation, when the fourth bowl is poured out on the earth, men will contend with a sun-induced heat wave, the like of which has never experienced. Even though a third part of the sun will be darkened, that which is left will be so powerful that it will scourge men with great heat. We've heard a lot about climate change. Well, climate change doesn't even come into this. This is of a much greater dimensions and proportion and calamity than anything that uh, the climate change people talk about. 
Some of us here and some who are listening have lived through heat waves at one time or other, and for some it has been distressing, as we know that people during these heat waves are much more prone to strokes and heart attacks. You will see that in every country where there has been a heat wave, more people die. You've heard of that, haven't you? That happens every year in some place, somewhere on earth, even at this present time. However, we have always received some relief in the evening or at least after some days. But during the tribulation, this will not go away after a few days. But added to the effects of this excruciating heat on the corrupt waterways and the rivers, we find man almost testing the torments of hell described by Jesus in Luke 16. But praise God. We don't need to go through this. No one needs to go through this. It is only those who deliberately disobey and do not accept the pardon and the forgiveness and the <coughs> grace that the Lord Jesus Christ offers to the whosoever will may come. People refuse to believe. People are so stubborn. One would think that this experience would drive men to their knees in repentance to God of creation. Instead, in this chapter is found the first of three occasions when men blasphemed the name of God and they repented not to give him glory. This illustrates the most severe rebellion and hostility to the will of God found anywhere in human history. The best commentary on this judgment comes from the pen of the prophet Malachi, the prophet who when speaking of that same day described it with these words. All that you read in Revelation, or a lot that you read in Revelation, is also foretold in many Old Testament books. And it would take another really deep study, but we are looking at it from time to time, and we're looking at some scripture now from Malachi 4, 1 and 2. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. Now that's really saying it, isn't it? Burn as an oven. Because I used to work on ovens. I was a baker. And I've worked on, on, on ovens in Broken Hill and, and Millicent and in Port Lincoln. I was working on the ovens. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. So the believers have nothing to worry about. We put our faith and trust in the Lord our God. The fifth judgment, darkness. Now in Revelation 16:10 we read, And the fifth angel poured out his bowl upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. They gnawed their tongue for pain. Revelation 16, 11, And blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they repented not of their deeds. See, their deeds were still evil. They repented not. The fact that the fifth bowl introduces darkness may be a singular expression of God's mercy to the rebellions, rebellious citizens of the earth during the tribulation period. Warren Wearsba, this is not a worldwide darkness only. The beast... His throne and his kingdom are affected. This rem reminds us of the fifth trumpet judgments in Revelations 9-2 and the ninth plague that we will be looking at, or we looked at in, in previously. Where is the throne, the beast? His image is in the temple in Jerusalem, so that may be the center of his operation. Or perhaps he is ruling from Rome to a cooperation with the apostate church headquartered there, or is it from Babylon, which is being rebuilt? at this present time. This darkness will be a great blow to his image throughout the earth, which is really going to be awesome. When God sent the ninth plague to Egypt, the entire land was dark except for Goshen. Remember? Where the children of Israel lived. The judgment of the fifth bowl is just the opposite. There is light for the world, but darkness reigns at the headquarters of the beast. For a certain period. This special judgment that seems to center on the headquarters of Antichrist, for it is poured out on the throne of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness. Two things would indicate that this darkness will prevail for some time upon the earth. The predictions of other prophets, the effects on men, this judgment, a repetition of the ninth plague of Egypt is to be understood again literally. Clarence Larkin says, when the fifth bowl is poured out, there will be darkness over the whole kingdom of the beast. And in Amos, we read, in Amos 5:18, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord, 
To what end is it to you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. Or the prophet Nahum in 1 8, but with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. Or in Sephaniah 1 15, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. What expressions they are. And all of this is going to take place during the tribulation period and during the end, just before the millennium. Interestingly, Christ's own predictions are also found in Matthew 13, 24, where Jesus spoke and said, but in those days, talking about the latter days, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Have you ever, and I'm asking you this question honestly, have you ever been in a place of utter darkness? But I can tell you I have, and it's not very pleasant at all. I went down the mines in Broken Hill at about 1,000 feet, metres I should say, much more than a feet, three times more, mm. 1,000 metres underground in the earth, and we were told all of a sudden, all of us who were in this group, to turn off our lights on our helmets. Yeah. And I can tell you, you know the, the expression, it was pitch black? Yeah. You know, you could not see anything. I have never, ever seen it that black before. Total, total, total darkness. And it was eerie. It was eerie. It really was. Sadly, throughout the second half of the tribulation period, we see they repented not. And this comes through all the while. This is so sad. During the first three and a half years, many people repented. But the second half of the three and a half year period, we read over and over again, they repented not, and they had taken already taken the mark of the beast. These judgments are so clearly supernatural that all men will know that they descend from God. We always talk about a God of love, and God is a God of love. God is a God of mercy, but God is also a God of judgment. When people continue to rebel, and this is right at the end of time, where he said, enough is enough, and he judges. He judges very, very strongly. But instead of falling down before him to become the recipient of his mercy, they only blaspheme the God of heaven because of their pains and sores and repented not of their deeds. The sixth bold judgment, the Euphrates River, that is a huge river. The Euphrates River dried up in Revelation 16, 12, 13 and 14. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl upon the great river Euphrates and the water thereof was dried up that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to battle of the great day of God Almighty. Revelation 16, 15 and 16. Behold, I come as a thief Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he gathered, 1616, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. The Euphrates River dried up, verse 12 to 16. This famous river was mentioned earlier in Revelation when the sixth trumpet sounded, <coughs> Revelations 19, 13 and onwards. And the angels were lo who were loosed were bound therein. At that time, an army of demonic horsemen were also released. Now an army from the nations of the world gathers for the great battle at Armageddon. The drying up of the river will make it possible for the army of the kings of the east to come to Israel and to invade the Holy Land. On September the 2nd, 1945, when General Douglas Mac MacArthur supervised signing the peace treaty with Japan. He said, we have had our last chance. If we will not devise something greater and more equitable than war, Armageddon will be at our door. He was already using that terminology. Armageddon will be at our door. The name Armageddon comes from two Hebrew words, Ha-Megiddo, the hill of Megiddo. The word Megiddo means the place of troops or the place of slaughter. 
Megiddo, Tel Megiddo is a Tel Megiddo, it is a pass, the Maris Pass. If you had to go to Jerusalem, you had to go to the Maris Pass, you had to go through the Valley of Armageddon. It is also called the Plain of Estralon and the Valley of Jezreel. This area is about 14 miles wide and 20 miles long and forms what Napo Napoleon called, because Napoleon also went to the Holy Land, the most natural battlefield of the whole earth. And this is Napoleon saying this. And he certainly wasn't a Christian. As I was standing there overlooking this great plain back in 1975 and again in 1993 and for the last five years, 205 to 210, I could well understand why it would be used for gathering the armies of the nations. It was on this plain that Barak defeated the armies of Canaan that we read about in Jude 5.19 and Gideon met the Midianites there, Jude 7, and it was there that uh, King Saul lost his life in 1 Samuel 31. Titus and the Roman army used this natural corridor as did the Crusaders in the Middle Ages. British General Allenby used it when he defeated the Turkish army in 1917. From a human viewpoint, it appears that the armies of the nations are gathering on their own, but John makes it clear that the military movement is, in the final analysis, it is according to God's plan. This, the satanic trinity, through demonic powers, will influence the nations and cause the rulers to assemble their armies. They will even work miracles that will impress the rulers and cause them to to cooperate, but all this will merely fulfill the will of God and accomplish his purposes. See Revelation 17, 17, which we hope to come to early next year. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the, word, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. The Gentile nations will look on Armageddon as a battle, but to God it will be only a supper for the birds of the air because that's exactly what is going to happen. It may sound awful, but it's true. Revelations 19, 17 to 21, we'll be coming back to this later again, but I'm just referring to this now. And I saw an angel standing in the sun and, the, and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great king. That's what I was referring to that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and then that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls of the birds were filled with their flesh. Zechariah 12 and 14 describe this event from Israel's point of view. Since the beast has set up his image in the temple of Jerusalem. And since many of the Jews will now bow down to him, it is natural that the holy city should be, should be the object of the attack. However, not only the Jews are involved, for God had a purpose for the Gentile nations as well. In Joel 3, 9 to 21, parallels the Segariah reference in Joel 3, 19, makes clear that God will punish the Gentiles for the way they have treated the Jewish people. See also Isaiah 24 and 7, I 3, 8. The outcome of the battle is recorded in Revelations 19. The Lord returns and defeats his enemies. Obviously, the assembling and marching armies create no problem for Almighty God. When the nations rage and defy him, as we read in Psalm 2, 4, and 5, 4, 4 to 5, it says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have, the, shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. That's awesome when that happens. And we can understand why it happens. Revelation 16, 13, and 14 
And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth of the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. We're going to look at that again. These, these three frog-like deceiving spirits, this part reveals the three unclean frog-like <coughs> spirits that will come from the mouth of the devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. You see that false trinity again? These deceiving spirits, by working miracles, before the kings of the earth and the whole world, will trick them into coming together for the battle of the great day of God Almighty. After the five preceding judgments of God, the earth will be in a terrible, terrible dilemma. Only by the supernatural spirit of deception on the part of Satan, Antichrist and the false prophet will be able to summon the kings and the armies of the world to the final conflict against God and his Christ. The timing of this event must be the very last days of the tribulation since the next bowl immediately concludes the tribulation with the destruction of Babylon. The seventh bowl judgment, the wrath of God. Revelation 16, 17, 18 and 19. And the seventh angel poured out the bowl into the air, into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And these, and there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great <coughs> earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. They're awesome verses, aren't they? And they're going to all be fulfilled. Revelation 16, 20. And listen to this. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not forth. Talking about a change, a change, unbelievable. 21, and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceedingly great. When the seventh angel pours out his bowl unto the air, a voice will be heard from the temple of God before the throne conveying a most welcome message. It is done. It is most welcome because it signifies that the consummation of tribulation, the conclusion of the day of wrath upon ungodly men, the end of time of Jacob, Israel's trouble. This final judgment of God will appear in the form of the world's greatest earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. It will destroy the great city, meaning the city of Babylon, the capital of the world at that time, dividing it <coughs> into three parts. Verse 19, the great city was divided. This city is at first unnamed, however, its identity we know. The Antichrist capital city called Babylon is called Great in verses 18 to 10, 18, 19 and 21. It is in chapter 18 described as the commercial emporium of the Antichrist empire. There may be many great cities of the end time, but from chapter 18 it is clear that this one alone is the great city, the city of Babylon. Some have said, will this be Rome or rebuild Babylon? Or we shall consider this in 179. But I do believe that Babylon, that has lain dormant but was never destroyed, it was meant to be, is being rebuilt at this very present time. And we'll show you some footage at the next Bible study and some up-to-date information. In any case, we know it's called Babylon. The very word Babylon in Scripture represents a composite of the continuing corrupt world system led by the unseen arch spirit of evil, Satan. The earthquake is sent by God, not merely by seismic activity, and it will split the beast capital into three. In Revelations 18.5, we read of Babylon's destruction in the words, and God hath remembered her iniquities. What occurs here is that 1619 shows that at the time of the seventh bowl, God destroys the capital city of the beast along with his satanic system and empire. And then chapter 17 and 18 
describes this destruction in detail. This is basically the same pattern that we will find in Genesis 1 and 2 describing the creation of man in Genesis 1. Then it comes to the brief description of man's creation on the sixth day. Then in Genesis 2 we are provided with more detailed description <coughs> of these events. So the Bible does that quite often. So we have a bit of information and then the next chapter gives a lot more information. And that's exactly what's going to happen in the next chapter when we go into more detail. So it is here. In 16.9, amid the catastrophic happenings of the seventh bowl, we are told that Babylon is remembered for destruction. Then in chapter 17 and 18, we have the full details of this destruction given. And that's what we're going to talk about, the Lord willing, next year. Not only is Antichrist's capital devastated, this city is totally devastated, but here we see that every island and the mountains of the world are affected. The whole wicked world is convulsed by an indignant and righteous God because the world has hearkened willingly to the man of sin and his satanic end time system. In addition, the cities of the nations fell, meaning that the cities of the world will be wiped out. In addition, every island will vanish and the mountains will not be found. This would indicate a complete renovation of the whole earth as we know it today. If this were not enough, catastrophe, great hailstone, <coughs> the weight of a talent. How heavy are they? About 135 pounds. So that's an awesome weight and that's an awesome size and that can bring awesome destruction. Will come down out of heaven upon men. It is difficult for us to conceive the hailstones that large or of the devastating effect that that would have upon men. Tennis ball size hailstones have fallen in Australia and destroyed thousands of cars that you could pick up very cheaply because it would cost a lot of money to repair it. Brand new cars were affected when hail that big. But this is a magnitude much, much larger and causes untold destruction, misery and death. Dr. David L. Cooper, <coughs> in commenting on this verse, draws attention to what the Lord said in Job 38, 22 to 23. Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail, which I have reserved against the time of trouble, against the day of battle and war? See, there again, Job, prophetically speaking, talks about this event that will take place in the end time. More details of this catastrophe will be seen in <coughs> Revelations 18 under the detailed destruction of the city of Babylon and in chapter 19 with the coming of Christ on the white horse to conquer the earth and to subdue it. Warren Wiersbe, in reviewing these three chapters, we see the encouragement they give to suffering Christians. The sealed 144,000 will arrive on Mount Zion and praise God. Revelations 14, 1 to 5. The martyrs will also be in glory, praising God. Revelations 15, 1 to 4. John's message is clear. It is possible to be victorious <coughs> over the beast and be an overcomer. Movements of armies, confederations of nations and worldwide opposition to God cannot hinder the Lord from fulfilling his word and from achieving his purposes. Men think they are free to do as they please, but in reality they are accomplishing the pains and purposes of God. Please take note, every generation of Christians has been able to identify with the events in Revelations 14 to 16. There has always been a beast to oppress God's people and a false prophet to try and lead them astray. We have always been on the verge of an Armageddon as the nations wage war. But in the last days, these <coughs> events will accelerate and the Bible's prophecies will be ultimately fulfilled in minute detail. God's word is truth and nothing will be changed. I know that I was born during the Second World War. My mother thought that the end of the world had come. You look at all the wars that have been fought and all the conquests for the last thousands of years. It is unbelievable. And even now, there are many conflicts. There are many wars. Every day, people are getting killed in warfare. But there will be one final battle which is unequaled with anything that has ever happened before. But we know it's for a shorter duration 
and we know the ultimate end results. So with many Christians, the world over, I believe, that the church, and I mean the true church, the true bride of Christ, who is looking for his coming, will not be on the scene at the time that we're talking about now. But both Jewish and Gentile believers will be living who will have to endure Antichrist rule. Because during, as we've said many times during these studies, during the tribulation period, because of the witness of the 144,000 special witnesses and the two, like Moses and Elijah, many people will be saved, thank God. But they will endure great hardship. Many will die for their faith and they cannot buy or sell without the mark of the beast. But praise God, many millions will yet be saved. But it would be so much better if so many more people could be raptured before all these things take place in the foreseeable future. Jewish and Gentiles, all those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Messiah during the tribulation period, countless numbers of people from all nations during the first half of the tribulation, most Jewish people are going to be saved during the second half of the tribulation and as a result of this great influence, as I said just then, the 144 special Jewish witnesses and the two special witnesses in Jerusalem, praise God, many people are going to be saved. So, the plea in Revelation 16, 15, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Jesus Christ may return at any time and it pays us to keep our lives clean, to watch and to be faithful. At the next Bible study, we will look at chapter 17, which deals with the desolation and destructions, and chapter 18 with the destruction of Babylon. But praise God, light is in sight. The king and his kingdom, Revelations 19 and 20. I always get so happy when I come to those last few chapters. After all this, these terrible events, to come to the king and his kingdom in Revelations 19 and 20 and talk about the new heaven, talk about the new earth, and talk about the new Jerusalem in, in Revelations 21 and the new paradise, its river, and the tree of life in Revelations 22 is going to be awesome. I just love coming to those last few chapters. Mm -hmm. Because this stuff that we looked at tonight is not pretty. But dear friends, it is going to happen. It is going to happen. And you cannot get around that. <coughs> if you believe in the Bible, the Bible warns and tells people beforehand, this is what's going to happen. It's for us to get that message across. Let's conclude with a word of prayer. And we've got a special treat for you. A minute. Gracious God, our eternal Heavenly Father, we, we fail sometimes to fully understand why so many people refuse to listen to what you are trying to say to us through your word. Help us, O oh Lord, to be faithful. Help us, O oh Lord, to love the people around us, but to also tell them that they need to prepare for the future, that there is life after death, there is a God, there is salvation available for the whosoever all we need to do is accept the lord jesus christ as our savior as our redeemer as our friend who paid the price in full we are all sinners we've all come short we all deserve punishment but we know that you are a gracious loving and forgiving god and that you will in no way cast us out that you say to us all the time come unto me and i will forgive you come unto me and i will give you rest Come unto me and I will help you. Father God, we pray for each and every one of us here that you will draw us all very close to yourself and that you will help us to live in such a way that we are a blessing to you and to those around us. Help us to be faithful. Forgive us, Lord, of our own shortcomings, our own sins, our own failings, but help us to grow spiritually in the love of God. Bless us till we meet again. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you again for coming.
Oh, mm-hmm. 